uh, today's show is a little different. Uh, normally we have uh, political animals on the show, uh, and in a sense we've got a different type of animal, uh, a bunch of animals on the show tonight. Uh, and uh, to introduce us to them, we first, uh, I would like to introduce John Creviston, who has brought some of them along. Welcome, John. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, John, you've been in Central Saanich for a few years now. I, I don't know how many years. 20 years. 20, 20 years, right? And uh, you were involved with the Crystal Gardens, if I'm not yes. mistaken. Yes, I was the curator of animals at the Crystal Garden Conservation Center for the last eight years of its existence. Last eight years, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I remember speaking with you before that uh, before that, you came, I think, from uh, Calgary, am I correct? Yes, I was a, a zookeeper for 17 years at the Calgary Zoo. 17. Mm -hmm. So what is the training that you'd have for, for all of this experience? Well, <laughs> in, my, in my case, in Calgary's case, they ran a four-year apprenticeship in zookeeping. Really? And so anybody there uh, with their process of on-site training as well as, uh, as exams and written papers and that sort of thing all, all along the way. So after that in four years, you got a certificate from the city of Calgary, mm. a diploma in public zookeeping, in fact. Oh, okay. Yeah. And is that zoo still in operation in Calgary? I don't know. I've never been there. Yeah, no, it's very much in operation. Oh, okay. Right, right. And so then you came to Victoria and you started working at Crystal uh, Gardens, correct? Yeah, I was. I, I came for two reasons. One, I grew up on the west coast with oh, my wife, right? So it was an opportunity to get home again. And secondly, uh, the Crystal Garden offered an, opp offered an opportunity to uh, take it in the conservation of wildlife direction, which is where my heart lies anyway. Mm, that's really interesting because I was talking to somebody the other day about the Crystal uh, Gardens, and and you get different reactions from people, as you probably okay. know. Uh, some felt, uh, this person in particular felt, oh well, but they felt sorry for the animals that were in there. Uh, and I, I don't know uh, uh, what your insights are about about people that feel that way, about uh, about zoos and about animals being kept, uh, I guess exotic animals in, in Canada and in the north. Well, it certainly uh, meets with a lot of controversy and it's a long discussion. I, I think where those come from, certainly there are bad examples everywhere animals not kept in the best conditions, but realistically in the professional operations, uh, animals are kept according to how they live in nature, how they live with each other, their social structure, that sort of thing. So we have a perception, for example, that animals should always be kept two by two, and so in Calgary and elsewhere, you strive to exhibit them two by two, not because it's good for the animals, but because it's good for people. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what goes on is to keep people happy, not necessarily as much to keep animals happy. The things we did for the animals was less visible to people. So and then the other part of it is people come along to a facility like that at the peak visiting time is usually early to mid-afternoon mm -hmm. when animals are in their siesta mode. Mm -hmm. And so that's the highest uh, attendance time. It's also the lowest activity time. So people often have a tendency to leap to conclusions that this animal is bored just because it's tired, it's nap time. Sleep time. You know, so they don't, they don't necessarily sleep in the, in the evenings? No, the night. peak time for most animals is usually uh, just before dawn and after, mm -hmm. after dawn, early morning, before it gets too bright and too uh, hot out in many mm -hmm. cases, or at uh, dusk and just the hours after that. So quiet time is usually middle of the day or middle of the night, really, for most animals. So that was your experience with Crystal uh, Gardens, and then, of course, it shut down, uh, and uh, wasn't, uh, as I recall, uh, a fun time for many people uh, as it was shutting down. There was some opposition to that happening. Um, ultimately, it's been shut down, and I, now I think it's a, an extension of the... Um, uh, the, uh, what is it? The, the, it's overflow space for the conference that's center. That's right, it's, it's a, a conference Victoria. center, that's what I was thinking. And it's, it's really, a, it's, the, sh the closure was a whole story in itself and a, mm -hmm. a very unpleasant story for everyone involved, as you mentioned, but it was also, uh, since that time, it, it has not been any more pleasant mm -hmm. and uh, it continues to cost the city of Victoria a tremendous amount of money to operate at oh, a loss. Even as an overflow 
Well, they already had access to it for overflow space even before. Oh. So now they have the entire building, and it's entirely their cost to operate. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's a, a problem they're dealing with and will continue to, I guess. I see. Well, uh, what happened to the animals uh, that were there? Well, that was a challenge because uh, in the world of, of proper zoological facilities, uh, animal collections are, are planned. In other words, uh, you, there's a perception sometimes that animals are hard to reproduce or they don't want to reproduce. In fact, the opposite is, is universally true. So most animals in the zoo setting, are their, their reproduction is restricted. And the reason for that is not because we don't want them to, but because we have to be able to provide proper homes for them. Hmm. So like puppies and kittens, just because you can produce them doesn't necessarily mean you should, even if they're highly endangered. So spaces in facilities like that are managed, and so a population is based on the number of quality spaces that are available to house those animals. So when a place like the Crystal closes down, and we had a number of endangered species there yeah, that were part of international there. programs, uh, they had to go somewhere, and yeah, yeah. in many cases, they were taken on by another facility somewhere, but not, not a planned uh, place. It was just an emergency placement. Mm -hmm. So you found a place for every every animal, um, all over North America, all over the world. Yes. Or, yeah. I yeah. see. Right. And a few stayed here. Okay. Right. And you'll meet a couple of them today. Great. Okay. Well, feel free to introduce us if you. If you don't mind, tell us a little well, bit about... To, to preface it, sure. what we did is, is I made a point at the Crystal Garden. Uh, our mandate was to focus on conservation of, of endangered species and participate in international programs for those species. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, by the time it closed, we had the highest proportion of representation of endangered species in, as parts of endangered species programs than of anywhere in the world for right. the small size of the Crystal Garden. So. A large portion of it was dedicated to that. One of them uh, was uh, uh, the Indian star tortoise, I'm going to bring out here in a moment. Mm -hmm. This was a special case in that in 1996, 232 newly hatched star tortoises, and tortoises are a land turtle, were smuggled into Canada to Toronto, you know, packed in, a, in eight cartons in a carry-on bag. They were intercepted by customs there and housed uh, uh, in a triage situation at the Toronto Zoo while their veterinary staff assessed them and tried to bring them to health. They basically split them into three groups, the groups that were perceived to be doing the best, groups that were doing very poorly, and a group that was on the borderline. Anyway, after they stabilized them, they went about, and by they, I mean the Canadian Wildlife Service, went about asking all around the world what facilities could accommodate some of them. And so the question will come up, well, couldn't they go back to the wild? And I'll address that now because ideally that would happen, but the pressures are still happening in the wild, even today. So animals are being collected in the wild and stored in boxes in the back 40 until somebody comes and collects them for, you know, for a few dollars for a whole bunch of them at various states of health. Then they're shipped to some middle person somewhere, maybe in Europe, and then off to wherever they go in the world. By the time they end up at a distant shore, they're off in that great shape, and so that's what we encountered. Okay. So, these guys were the size of ping pong balls, and uh, and this is one of those babies, <clears throat> no longer the size of a ping pong ball. So this is a, a, a male, I should say female, and she was one of 10 that we accepted. We, we accepted 10 because we thought we would face a lot of, of heavy losses. In fact, when we got those 10 little babies, um, we did lose two of them fairly early on, the two very smallest. Mm. But the other eight, we uh, had, had, took extensive effort to bring them back to health over a long period of time. We tracked their weight daily and, and their, their growth and uh, monitor their health in, in general. And, and uh, we're, for, we're actually fortunate and proud to say that eight of them lived on to grow into what you see here. And they've and, and since... They, they had, were originally the size of a ping pong ball? Yes. Yeah. Big. That's amazing, yeah. And uh, yeah. they've since had not only offspring, but grand offspring oh, as well. Wow. Mm -hmm. So that's the good news part of the story. Huh. 
But uh, uh, how old then is this one? This one would be because they were newly hatched. We know fairly, fairly closely their age. But in '95 they would have hatched, maybe in the sp uh, summer or fall of 1995. So that puts them at about 21 now. Wow. And they can live upwards of, uh, well, 80 years wouldn't be really? wouldn't be a, a short lifespan. So 80 years or more. Nope. And that's one thing they do is pee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right on cue. Right? Well, in <laughs> fact, I, if I've had an animal to a school program, the thing that kids will memorialize in their artwork is whenever an animal poops on someone, like the teacher. <laughs> then that will be a factor in every piece of artwork they produce. <laughs> <laughs> All right. First anyway, for the show. For, I, I just talk about this for just a moment. Yeah. This pattern is the reason they're, they were smuggled. And when they're little, they don't have such an elaborate pattern. But that is uh, very appealing, very attractive. And the question comes up, well, why would an animal have such a liability, hmm. right? Something that makes them vulnerable to that? Wouldn't, wouldn't anybody see this animal somewhere? Wouldn't it be vulnerable to predators? Not much less uh, people. Hmm. Well, here's what happens. If you see this in a, a semi-desert environment, with lots of dry grasses, all the uh, dark shadows on the ground, all the dry grasses crisscrossing back and forth, yeah. they disappear. Okay. And in fact, I did a little experiment when they were about half the size I went to do a presentation in Drumheller at the Royal Terrell Museum. And uh, prior to that, I took them out behind the Crystal Garden where there's a construction zone where there's some uh, zones that look kind of like that and had those dry grasses. And I just crisscrossed them uh, like they would be in the wild. And I stood back at my height and took photographs of them. And when they came back, I couldn't see them in the photographs, even though I knew darn well they were there. Yeah. So. Uh -huh. It was very effective. As a matter of fact, I didn't use those those particular photographs. I had to use the ones that we could at least see them a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I, I did show one of them actually, and people in the audience just thought I was lying. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty remarkable. So, do they um, in its pen? Does it have water that it goes into, or, or no. stays on sort of land? Or these are a terrestrial does it swim or no? No, they're a terrestrial animal. Okay. So they're totally a, a, a dry land. Yeah. Uh, these claws, you can see here yeah. on the back feet, uh, these are for digging, oh, for egg laying. Oh. So particularly on a female like this, so she'll, just like a sea turtle, she'll yeah. scoop the soil with those and, and make a nice little uh, excavation down deep, mm -hmm. drop eggs in there and then uh, cover it all back up and mm -hmm. pee on it and tap it all down. Okay. And I should say that when I say pee, that's not urine like a mammal would have, it's, it's really just water. Uh. Fascinating, so. yeah, and uh, and they're totally vegetarian. What what country did you say that they would be? From? These are Indian star tortoises, Indian. In India. Yeah, and there's uh, they kind of range across India and Sri Lanka and adjacent in Burma as well, or what was Burma? I, are they common? Are they endangered? In These India? ones are not too bad off. They're kind of in between. They're they're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So as species go, they're not so bad yet, but. Mm -hmm. The way the trends are going, it won't be long before they're in a sorry state the way many others are. Mm. And that's why they were uh, illegal to bring into the country the way they did. Yeah, do you in think the first place. does that problem still happen? Or is it, it does. Worse, do you think? Is people bringing in stuff and various animals and critters? And no, it still happens. It still happens all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't want to encourage that. But, uh, no, well, uh, you know, because this one did well and a few others did well. I have to say that most of them did not. Mm. You know, most of them end up dying. Most of those 232 did not survive. So while we're talking about a good news story, mm -hmm. it's not the majority of them. Right. Uh, right. And one of the reasons we felt very proud of our success with them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So put her back. Okay. Right. This is another tortoise. Tortoise. <clears throat> this, this is a radiated tortoise from Madagascar. Uh, this one is actually quite a bit younger than the one we just met, uh, even though it's bigger. It's a larger species. These are from Madagascar. These are highly endangered, and they are still being smuggled. So the more endangered they are, the more their monetary value goes up on the black market. So the more incentive there is to, to do so. So 
uh, there's an, a close related species in Madagascar called the plowshare tortoise. It's even worse shape. And what they've done in the, the wildlife people there is they've actually gone out there and etched numbers into the shell, mm -hmm. which disfigures them a little bit, but it protects them from, you know, from poachers. They, they, they can't move an animal like that. Then. I see. So it, it's a harsh way to deal with it. It doesn't actually hurt them, mm -hmm. but it, it, it should be unnecessary, but it's the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So how old is this one, you say? This one would be... A little younger, you said, so... Uh, yeah, about about 18, I'm guessing. Yeah. We didn't know for sure you because we're already okay. larger when they came. Right. Still, they've, they've grown a lot since that time. Do you have to be careful how close you get your fingers to... No, they're very placid animals. And they're not going to snuff your finger or anything? And they're very, very smart, too. I mean, oh. they, they can tell. I mean, he's never been here before. Yeah. But on the rare occasions I have them at my home before going to a, to a program, for example, if it's a summertime, yeah. if I put them in the backyard, they all know exactly the spots they go to, even if they haven't been there for a year or two. Wow. That's so they remember. Really fascinating. And they're very curious. So they're, uh, right now, he's, he'd like nothing better than to explore around the room here. But, uh, <laughs> very um, cute. again, very, uh, totally vegetarian. Yeah. So animals like this really rely on a lot of fiber. Yeah. So they'll consume a lot of grass, for example. Okay. I was going to ask you, what do you, so you're off buying lettuce all the time? I mean, yeah. Lettuce is a, is a treat. Lettuce is, is almost not fibrous enough for them. Oh. So uh, really harsher things, low nutrient value things do better for them or are better for them generally. So. Think of them a little bit like a horse or a cow. They need to consume a lot of low-calorie fibrous material. They produce a lot. They digest a lot. They poop a lot. And in fact, I didn't bring any today. But in fact, if you wash out their their feces, it just comes out like a like like straw. It's actually quite fascinating. It just looks like a, doesn't look like animal poop. It looks like well, like like. A, I don't know, like, like a bunch of dry grass. Uh-huh. Well, I, so, I guess you got to get into that, too, if you're going to take care of them. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you wouldn't know that when it first comes out of them, but uh, after, you know, rain washes it away, that's what's left. I see. Huh. So one thing I, I, I should mention, too, when you talk about these animals, is, <coughs> is the shell. Uh, because there's often a misconception about what that is. What the shell is composed of are rib bones that are flattened and fused together. So if you if you look at it underneath these scales, it's, it's a little bit like this like a person's skull. You see all the bones kind of all knitted together, mm -hmm. but it's all the different ribs that are knitted together. And then on top of that is our scales, which are made of keratin, so they feel like they're the same as nails. Okay, they feel like finger fingers. Like, 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 oh, yeah, like fingernails. So, sort of. So while he doesn't have nerve endings at the tips of them, he would feel that underneath, like when we touch our oh, nails. I so you'd feel the pressure and that sort of yeah. thing. But you wouldn't feel it uh, uh, like you would on skin. Yeah. Where are you going? He's very curious. Explorer. Anyway. And this um, one as well as land or terrestrial. Yes. Yeah. And I should say that in England and Australia, some of the British colonies uh, often refer to all turtles as tortoises. Here in North America, we tend to think of turtles as aquatic and tortoises as, as terrestrial or land-based. And one of the ways we can tell that are by looking at their feet. So we like to say that tortoises have elephant feet. Yeah. Uh, if this was a turtle, especially a sea turtle, be they'd wet. be flippers. Uh, yeah. And then things like western painted turtles that we have in our ponds around here are kind of an intermediate. Okay. So they have feet that can allow them to walk, but also they're flattened. They're, they're like, like a hybrid, okay. like a hybrid animal in a way. It's what they seem like. Hybrid adaptations anyway. I don't know, has the camera been able to see the face? What a character. And this <laughs> part here, handsome looking, of the bottom shell, Yes. what they do with this, especially males, is when they're competing with each other, they like to take this and scoop it under the shell of another male and flip them over. Oh. It's a little bit like a 
like a jack almost. <laughs> That's their <laughs> trick. They can disable them. They don't kill each other, but they, they immobilize them so they can carry on with their business and meeting while the other guy's trying to write himself. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. It's fascinating to see how evolution works here. Eh? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, the world is full of amazing things. Yeah, I bet. And uh, really gorgeous. the last thing I'll mention uh, is when this torus was hatched, all these little yellow spots here, mm -hmm. those were connected together. They were the original shell. So as they grow, they add rings and rings and rings, oh. and these things grow apart. So that's oh. how they actually get bigger and bigger. Well, this one, this is at full size? Pretty close. Pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty close, eh? You know, reptiles continue to grow throughout their life, but their growth becomes almost imperceptible as they age. Yeah. So unlike us, we do actually stop growing. They don't. They will continue to grow. Does it need a lot of room uh, in its home tank, I guess? Where they live in nature, they would cover a fairly large area just to find enough to eat. So we find if they don't have to do that, or they don't have to travel far for mates, for example, or for water when they need it, uh, then they don't need as much space. They don't, they don't try as hard, mm -hmm. even in nature. If they have things at their doorstep, then they're not going to, you know, exert themselves any more than they need to. Mm -hmm. And especially for an animal that consumes low calorie uh, diet. So exer exerting a lot of energy unnecessarily is not what they prefer to do. Well, thank you for showing us that one. Yeah. Put this Look guy in the back. Next. Next we have a prehensile-tailed skink, or a monkey-tailed skink, or a Solomon Island skink. All three okay. names okay. are, are uh, used. And uh, this is a lizard from uh, the South Pacific. Anything we should know before we get close to it? Is it, is it, is it don't get your fingers too close? Or? Uh, mostly they're tree climbing lizards, they have very sharp claws. Ah, okay. So I often go away with lots of little perforations in my skin. Oh, okay. Not because he tries to harm me, but because he thinks, yeah, he treats me like I'm a tree. Of course, yeah. So this oh. is Roscoe. <laughs> Roscoe was born at the Crystal Garden, and he's in the middle of shedding right now. Okay. And <laughs> talk a little bit about shedding, it's because you can like, see it on him. It's like he's smiling constantly. Reptiles shed their skin in larger pieces. We shed our skin in tons of tiny, tiny pieces that uh -huh. become dust in our houses, etc. Right. Uh, reptiles tend to shed it in larger, larger pieces. Okay. So I mentioned he's a tree climbing lizard. Yes. And uh, he's also known as a monkey tail skink or prehensile tail skink. And if you can, well, now he's okay, but you'll notice sometimes he's grasping with his tail a yeah. little bit. And he'll do that again in a moment when he comes back around. So is he inclined he wants to climb higher? or Oftentimes, yeah. uh, but sometimes he just has something else in mind altogether. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't always know what that is. Yeah. Hello. These are, uh, <laughs> these are another entirely vegetarian lizard. Uh -huh. So they wouldn't even dream of eating an insect or a, a bird or anything else like that. They're entirely vegetarian. These are... Um, Unusual amongst their type of lizard, skinks, in that they're large, and most skinks are, have very short limbs, sometimes almost no limbs at all, almost like a snake in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, these guys are unique in that they're arboreal or tree climbing, and they have uh, large limbs and long toes mm -hmm. and sharp claws for climbing. Uh, one of the things that makes them really unique is that they pair bond for life, so that they, they meet and form a, a relationship that lasts. And they live a long, long time, at least 30 to 40 years. Wow. And, and they, they stay together. They stay together. Too. Yeah. And along the way, the female will produce usually one, occasionally twins, after about every two years. Yeah. After an eight-month gestation, and they have, they're live bears. And they have, a, a, yeah. unusual for reptiles, in that they have a, a, a kind of a placenta. Very much like a mammalian. Fascinating, person. really. And and do you say you have to? Uh, or is we, this just the one? We have he, him and his uh, son and daughter. Oh, yeah. We lost the female. The female is much older than oh. him. 
we lost her last year. And what country did you say? They're from the Solomon Islands, Solomon Islands. Pacific. Pacific. So yeah. just northeast of Australia. Mm -hmm. Tropical. When I see uh, typhoons or hurricane damage down there, I always think of how many of these are rendered homeless. Uh -huh. But uh, again, there are species that uh, at times uh, is legally exported, but at other times it's illegal to export them, they're smuggled in. Mm -hmm. uh, are you about to fall off the back? No, he won't fall. Because no. he's got a pretty good claws. Yeah, so good that it's hard to dis detach yeah. him. <laughs> Come on, let's go. Come back. I was there hoping to. Uh, I was hoping to uh, show you his tail action. Yeah. Oh, he's he's got a good pose right now. So they do. Yeah, they have a lot of unique features about them, and uh, you know. Um, there's kind of a perception out there that reptiles are not particularly bright. Mm -hmm. And I want to dispel that. You know, they may not be Einstein, but they're capable of a lot more thought and decision making than we think they are. So they go through pros, they recognize individuals. Certainly they recognize different people. And they certainly recognize their situation and uh, <clears throat> that sort of thing. So How do you manage to feed all these? Well, fortunately, because they're all vegetarian, it's... it's are you vegetarian? You may as well be. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not, but, uh, um, but, uh, yeah, so they did, suppose. There you go. <laughs> and so do they. And interestingly enough, um, also from the Crystal Garden, we have pygmy marmoset monkeys, the tiniest monkeys in the world. And part of their diet is something, a commercial diet called marmoset diet. It's canned diet. Huh. Huh. They also like it. Huh. And they also like yogurt. Wow. Which is a totally foreign thing for them, but wow. you know, but lots of things we eat are foreign to us too. True enough. Yeah. So, yeah. for whatever reason, he likes both of those things. <laughs> you know, and sometimes more than he would like the things he should be eating in the wild. It's a bit of a cool night. Uh, how how are they? With, I guess in their home country, they would it wouldn't be very cold at all. No, no. Where they are, their climate would be very stable and very warm. Yeah. Truly a tropical. So you blizzard. must have to be careful there. about that. Here, I suppose. Well, this evening it's cool outside, so I don't want to keep them out too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, unlike a mammal or a bird where we get cold and shiver, they won't shiver. Mm -hmm. They just slow down and and uh, yeah. eventually just stop. Yeah. So they wouldn't feel it the same way. Right. I should say, too, on that topic regarding the tortoises or the skinks or any other reptile, we tend to group them as cold blooded, mm -hmm. and that's uh, not really an accurate description. And I say that because. Well, they generally can't maintain their body at a warm temperature the way a mammal or a bird can. Some reptiles have some ability to do that, but they still need to modify the climate to be warm. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they, they, they bask, they come out on warm days, so they can operate at a warm temperature like a mammal or a bird. Mm -hmm. Fish and amphibians, on the other hand, don't. They, they operate at that environmental temperature that they're designed to be in. Okay. So they don't... Uh, they don't really bask or modify their temperatures the same way. Yeah. So a mammal, I like to put it this way, like a reptile tries to be a mammal. Understood, yeah. I see, <laughs> it tries to be a mammal. Looks like Roscoe's trying to get back to his... Uh, I'm not his sure what he has there. in mind, but... Uh, anyway, <laughs> what else can you tell us here, John? Oh. Thank you so much for coming in. Just a little image of that tail there. Oh, there you go, yeah. Now wrap if I, around. He can, he can hold on tighter than that if he wants to. Yes. And it's really an anchor. Uh -huh. Okay, Roscoe, are you going to... Are you going to be able to get him off? If he oh, yeah. I just, just have to uh, work it properly. I see. And get him going the right direction. <laughs> well, I'm sure you've done it a few times. Well, <laughs> this may take a moment. There we go. <laughs> Have fun for tonight, Roscoe. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, you brought something else as well. Oh, I did. And uh, for people in, in on the West Coast here, they'll see something like this when they travel to uh, various parks or beaches or waterways. You may see nest boxes like this yep. in various locations. I think I've seen it in Todd Inlet, 
for example. Yeah. Is that correct? And what they are are nest boxes for a bird called, called the purple martin. Purple martins are North America's largest species of swallow. Mm. And by the mid 80s, 1980s, we only had about five pairs left in BC, wow. which is well, you know, way well down. We, we almost lost them. And the similar numbers in Washington State, Oregon, and California, all areas that were the historic range of these birds. There are purple martins in other parts of the continent. Certainly people in Alberta, Saskatchewan, East are familiar with them. And those are the birds you often see in those big, large condo houses with tons of holes in them. Mm. Our West Coast ones won't use those holes, those, those condos. They like their semi-detached living, <laughs> a, a separate house. They still like to be together in a colony. They don't want to share walls, but, uh, but they don't want to... It's a West Coast thing. The West Coast thing. Right. All of them, interesting enough, all of them migrate every fall all the way back to southern Brazil, where they mix really? and mingle, Amazing. and spend the winter, and then they fly all the way back here to nest and raise their young. Wow. So. People didn't deliberately get rid of them, but what happened was they tended to nest in standing snags, old dead trees, colonies of trees, mm -hmm. where there was enough of them with rotten woodpecker holes and things like that that could accommodate a colony of them. We came along in our wisdom and said, those are worthless, right. those are dangerous, let's get rid of them all. Clean them all up, yeah. So we did that, and then but along the way what that did was rendered them homeless Interesting. or unable to reproduce. Right. So, years ago it was determined, you know, starting in the 80s, that a nest box program would be acceptable and they would accept them and use them. And that has, in fact, been the case. So, we've seen in this species a huge recovery mm -hmm. in their numbers. And now we have a few thousand coming every year to BC alone. Mm -hmm. And every year more than the year before. In fact, this past year, uh, we see them in places that we didn't know of them historically, even, even before their numbers declined. In places like where? Uh, out in Euclid. Okay. And up in Fort McNeil. And with natural, like oh, living nest in boxes. or n nest boxes. Yeah. So that's a question I have: is uh, humans have impacted these various uh, animals, uh, and then we are they becoming reliant on on us to build these types of things for them too? And it's an excellent yeah. question. And uh, and uh, in time, what we need to do is allow natural nesting sites to recur. Right. But they're not going to recur fast enough. Mm. So in the meantime, we want this to happen. So for my part, what I did, since we know the nest boxes work, I've been looking after the Todd Inlet colony since, oh, 2004 or earlier. And uh, my goal was to try to get them ultimately back to a natural site, or natural nesting habit, before they forget how to be per martins. And so the goal was to try and create artificial trees that looked like real trees and so that they won't, wouldn't forget what those are like. So along the way, what I wanted to know, what's important in the nest box? We know that these boxes traditionally work very well for them. If I build an artificial tree or a colony of artificial trees, what are the important features I should build into them? Because it's, it's a significant effort to build them. So what I did initially is I made a number of round boxes out of a 6 inch pipe and 12 inch pipe. I put different sizes and shapes of openings, some with porches, some without. I faced them and sold them with different openings facing different directions. And I found that uh, the birds didn't really care as long as they were together, but not sharing walls. Mm -hmm. I did learn that a six inch round box was too small uh, distance wise from front to back, not for the birds, they used them, but it allowed predators such as owls to be able to land on them and reach in and grab babies and pull them up. So I know that it shouldn't be too shallow. Purple martins will accept them, but it won't be successful for them mm. in a lot of cases. I also, in 2010, built one of them to look like a shuttlecraft from Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And I did that, partly as a joke, but partly as to see how far I could push it with these birds. How, you know, what, what, again, I was trying to look at what was important to them. If I'm gonna build artificial trees, what are the features that really matter? And I've learned a few things already. Yeah. Well, they accepted that shuttlecraft and they used it every, every year since. So this year, this past winter, uh, I built eight more 
nest box. Well, I built a, a whole bunch more nest boxes and, and repaired a, a lot of others. But I built eight specifically look like uh, like old time recreational vehicles, old trailers, right. travel I've trailers seen from those ones. Yeah. from you know the 1950s. When you paddle in and taut in, like you'll see those. Yes. Right. And I built those again just for fun, but I also had a lot of nests down there, and I thought they'll use them or they won't. Uh -huh. They use every one of them. Yeah. And oftentimes nest boxes don't get accepted the first year. They accepted and raised babies in every single one of them, huh. even though they're all different colors and different looks to them. So, what did I learn? I learned that I just can't make the boxes too shallow. Yes. And apart from that, the rest of it is less important. It's more important to you than to them. Yes. So when I started this year, I did something similar, a transition. I built a round tower with nest boxes sliding all around it. I see. And that was a transition to a natural or semi-natural tree. And uh, eight of those nine boxes in that tree were used this year as well, huh. first year. So, um, Is there anything that, that uh, people should know? I mean, people that own properties, have old snags, trees. You're quite right. I think that people generally say, well, you know what, that's not valuable. Um, or even perhaps uh, park maintenance people, um, they, they probably increasingly do value such trees, but, uh, but this may be an example of leaving some. Well, old, old dead trees, unless they're posing a hazard to people, a serious hazard to people, really are extremely valuable for all kinds of wildlife, for all kinds of things. Food for woodpeckers, uh, among others, food for beetles, and mm -hmm. things, things of that nature that use decaying wood. Uh, it really is important uh, in so many ways. So we're much better now than we used to be at understanding those relationships and not considering them just to be um, superficially a waste of time. Well, I, I really want to thank you for showing us some some creatures from uh, other countries, but then bringing us right back to home and an example of. Uh, of uh, an animal that lives in our own backyard, I guess, or in, in not far from it. Well, so, yeah. and you know, he, here's, here's the parting message. Um, we see all around the world news of, of decline of species, and it certainly is true. But you know, it's easy to throw up your hands and, and, and be in despair and think it's a waste of time. We, we have nothing we can do. Well, purple martins are an example of something we can do. Mm -hmm. And together, I mean, I certainly can do this by myself, but together with people looking after colonies all up and down the coast of North America, we brought the numbers back to historical levels or more. So you can make a difference. And uh, I was involved in the 80s in a program to reintroduce a species called the swift fox to Canadian prairie, a species that had been gone since 1938 mm -hmm. and largely gone through much of the U.S. as well. Well, now we've got the numbers back to historic numbers, and our population has reinfiltrated Montana and given them a historical population again as well. So you can do things. You good, can make a difference. Good positive message. Uh, does John Creveston have a website or somewhere where people can go to find out more, say, about the Purple well, Martin? And Oasis. I, my, I have a society that evolved out of the Crystal Garden closure and it's called Oasis. O-A-E-S-E? -E, or no, O-A-S-E-S, -E sorry. And the website is www. O-A-S-E-S dot -E org. Ah, I see. Okay, well, John, thank you very much for coming on our show and, uh, and educating us a little bit more. Hi, you can see him. <laughs> thank you. Great.